Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name is Dulce Doherty and in this podcast series, I will be speaking to investors, advisors, entrepreneurs and recruiters who are based all over the world and we will be discussing how to set up, scale and operate a world-class recruitment company. Today, I'm speaking to Mark Hopkins. He's a well-known recruiter from Birmingham. He runs his own agency, and has done for the last few years doing engineering, technical and sales professionals into the manufacturing industry. Um, he's worked for Reed for a long time and worked his way up in that business and has a good perspective of what's happened over the past few years and what he sees coming. And he's put a lot of time and effort into helping other recruiters get better and setting up the recruiter, the recruiter arms um, which is uh, an online platform that he co-founded. And also, he's mad on to making videos and to helping his recruitment process. And he is leading the way in creating personal branded videos in, in, uh, in his sector. And uh, he's using that to good effect. So we had a great chat. Had a bit of a moan about Brexit, as you can imagine bit of uncertainty that's hit the market um, and we compared notes on what it's like to be an independent recruiter, um, the joys of doing that with kids and, you know, if we have any insecurities that we're not building large call centres, we want to do a bit of that and that, uh, yeah, just the, the pros and cons of that and maybe some of the challenges that we see on a day-to-day -day basis just had a general chat about all the things that we see happening in the industry. So really enjoyed it. Lovely lad. Knows his stuff. And, and yeah, another great guest. So hope you all enjoy it. Happy hunting. He got over what happened after World War Two, Like, the... America went on to be the and Fenton O'Toole has this mantra where he says it's a lot of it is a hangover from Britain's great colonial past and they just haven't got over the fact that in today's world they're a small nation and as a result if you see a lot of the Brexiteers media and stuff it's it's all about this World War Two rhetoric, which yeah. is completely irrelevant for today's world. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent agree, hundred percent agree. And even when I speak to my parents, they 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 even have that same kind of you know imperial in thought process where we were brilliant before uh, the East or not the EU per se it was the e EEC was it or EC ECJ I can't remember which one it was called now, and uh, before they joined it, they. They believed that the UK was the leader of the world when reality is they weren't. They were in three day weeks, bins were piling up. Um, it was the poor man of Britain, of, of Europe, so sorry. And it, it was it was not that kind of place that they thought it was. Um, <laughs> this is a very unbalanced argument, isn't it? <laughs> it is a very, yeah, it's totally unbalanced. <laughs> two, two, two remainers having a go. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is I do see it from their perspective because when I came, when it came to me putting a cross in the box I was almost convinced to vote Brexit from the, the what the Farage and what was written on the side of a bus and, and, and what they were saying the reason I voted for me was because I believe the status quo to be fair was doing well for us the country was doing fairly well and I felt that moving into the future, we, we could continue working with the, the EU the way we're going. Um, but also, what well, it was the Tory government that put me right off it mm. and have badly controlled, well, for the last six or seven years up until that point, they just really weren't a very good government. And, and, and that worried me about how we're going to move forward in a negotiation with the EU. And I, f I hate to say it, I told you so, because this is what's happening now. Yeah. Ca Cameron... Cameron had had some form of charm, but uh, uh, Reese Mogg and uh, and Boris are just the. It's just that they have that that public school boy elite don't care about 
really what else happens just as long as them and their cronies are taken care of. 100%. 100%. And, you know, this conspiracy theories are why they, they, they want to push Brexit so much. Um, things like the new uh, financial tax. Uh, so basically, they've, they've got to give up all their books and say they, they, where their money's been paid off and, and they can't de- deviate from tax and so forth. I can't remember the name of the law now, but there's a lot of conspiracy around that's why they want to leave Europe. Um, and then you've got Remainers, uh, sorry, Brexiteers like Dyson then going over to Singapore. You, there's, there's so much. Mm. That, I can't get my head around with this. With it, but... so so let's let's not digress too much because <laughs> I, I want to I, I want to understand what this means for us as an industry as much as anything else. And I'll, I'll give you my my take if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. So, so from what I can see, UK recruitment businesses on the mainland, in in especially in England, are pretending nothing's happened. Correct. <laughs> The, it, it, it's business as usual. We're not going to hit a dip. Doesn't matter what's happening. Um, it, we're growing. That's it. And nobody's allowed to talk about it. Nobody's allowed to discuss it. We're not going to debate it. It is what it is, and we'll be okay. And that's what I see from them. Yeah. From Dublin, I see the I see that multiplied out even. So they're even more confident that Brexit's a wonderful thing. They're like, we're going to get all the banks. We're going to have this. It's going to, it's going to do X, Y, and Z. It's great. And I think they're both overconfident, if I'm honest. I, I, I think that Dublin is going to do okay initially, but the rest of Ireland is going to suffer so bad, especially yeah. the border count- counties that I'm from. The, yeah. We've already seen that you know, it, it, there's been a few warning shots in Derry, and if if that border goes up, which let's be honest, that's what's looking like. E, the EU are probably just going to find a way to do some legal fuckery to throw Ireland under the bus, and that border is going to go up, and we're going to be back to trouble times of what uh, what we had in my youth. So. Well, this is it, and and we're slowly starting to see a few little bits of issues and troubles starting to yeah. pop up in the last couple of weeks. Um, it's it's a it's a nervous time, and I don't want to see the sixties, seventies, eighties of Northern Ireland ever again. No, you know, no would... nobody does. So you break free from Europe, and you still keep a corporation tax high. It, it, it I, I I don't understand. The business argument for what they're for what they're up to, like it it almost labor have said that they'll they'll actually increase the tax the corporate taxation. So wait, wait, yeah. why would companies move here? This is this is the nervous part we're in, isn't it? With regards to Brexit, we have you know I I try to think my, my political affiliation is centre ground. So I'm not at the moment I'm politically homeless because when you look at Corbyn trying to be very socialist, put up tax and then you look at the Tories trying to turn us into some sort of Singapore of Europe and, and, and trying to reduce tax but the, the, the issues and, and problems in between um, are not being resolved between them both so you, you kind of think right so we leave Europe and then what we, we have a, a socialist government or I don't know if they can become socialist but a semi-socialist government or do we go down the hardline government of Tories where we have more of this more cuts more austerity uh, but you know, business tax is going to be dropped to what? What? Some some figures I've heard is fifteen percent, um, which will be a bonus for business. I get that, but then you know, you're you're really going to at risk of voters if more austerity happens once the Brexit happens and the north of England and and parts of of uh, the Midlands realise that Brexit wasn't really that good for them. That's that's the Tories gone. But who next? So it's it's a strange one. Where I think we're going to see about two or three, maybe five years of uncertainty in the UK. It's going to look, it's not going to be as bad as the recession, I don't think. I think business is still going to move forward. People are still going to trade. People are still going to do whatever they can. Um, but if we have a hard Brexit, believe it or not, I think that will probably be better for, for Ireland and the UK over this kind of Theresa May kind of Brexit because that still ties us to Europe with none of the benefits of Europe. Mm. Uh, but I would like to see a second people as well. That's that's my personal opinion. Yeah, 
see what the public is still thinking. Is it still is this is there still traction for this? What um, does it mean for you as an independent recruiter? What from what my perspective? That- yeah, I mean, I, I work manufacturing, so manufacturing engineers, manufacturing uh, engineering um, across the whole country. And what I have heard and what I've seen is the recruitment industry is a very positive industry. Even during the recession, we were we were like, yeah, let's just crack on, let's try to make money. Um, with the manufacturers and the managing directors I speak to daily, there's nervousness, but they still got that same mentality. They, you know, but one manufacturing manager said to me quite recently, actually, um, I've in 30 years of being in business, I've never seen certainty. I don't even know what that looks like. So when you look at it from that perspective, you can kind of see that there's always been ups and downs through business throughout the years. And we've always had a recession every seven, eight years, some bigger than others, some some no, not many people would have noticed. So I think from from some of the manufacturers. All it's done for them is just pause some projects and then recuperate somewhere, bring the money to something else, another project, or hold it and save it and wait to see what happens and then move forward on the next plan. The problem with that, the impact on me as a recruiter, that means some companies last year, two companies put recruitment completely on hold until after Brexit. Um, Some of the smaller companies, they have jobs, they are looking for people, but they're saying to me, you know, keep looking up, but we're not going to jump on it just yet unless someone special comes along and then we might run with it. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of, you're in this, I call it like a stalemate. You've got work. I've got loads of work, um, but I'm kind of like looking for purple squirrels now just to make money. And mm-hmm. it's, it's a difficult place. It really is. So let's, let's jump into how you, got into recruitment you, you you kind of come from that engineering background initially yeah that's it i i mean i my i i left school at 16 i went to uh, a, a governmental trainee scheme in the mod um at uh, a place called aberporth in west wales uh, near cardigan if anyone's ever been there um and so right, glamorous it's, oh, it's beautiful. Well, this might make it even more glamorous for you. Um, <laughs> where, where we were, where I was training, basically. But you, basically, when, you, when you're 16, you kind of come out of school with like, I had some crap GCSEs. I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life, if I'm honest with you. Engineering is always something I, I liked off the TV, like Star Trek. I thought, oh, engineering looks like an interesting thing. So I went in there with open eyes, and I used to pull TVs apart when I was 13 as well. Um, so I went into this, and and... We're, we're the, the MOD bases at Aberporth. They test missiles and they have apprenticeships there as well. But we weren't apprentices. We were just trainees and we were living on an old Canadian Air Force base with asbestos walls and everything. And uh, we paid 30 quid a week and we were going to college one day a week. And there was a workshop there. We were learning milling and turning and electronics and fabrication and stuff like that. And I did that for two years and, and I got really good at, in, and really loved engineering at the time as well. So I applied for um, an apprenticeship with um, the RAF, at RAF St. Athen. And um, I got it. I got in straight away and I couldn't believe it. And it was like something like 30,000 kids apply for this apprenticeship every year. And I was one of, I think they bring in 60 people a year, I think it was back then. Um, so I was I was blown away. Went to RAF St. Athen, did an apprenticeship there. Worked on extraordinary aircraft and military aircraft during the Kosovo Bosnian uh, kind of situation at the time. So we were seeing aircraft with bullet holes in it and, and repairs that would need to be done and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, had had a great time there. That was until about two thousand and one, two thousand and two, and then I went to Bristol University. Well, actually, uh, Bristol College which was a satellite of Kingston University at the time to uh, study a degree in, in uh, aircraft maintenance, it was at the time. But the reason I did it was to get my licenses to work on commercial aircraft. Mm. Yeah, well, we were going through some weird time, and it was the time when Tony Blair started selling off chunks of the MOD to privatised companies um, so that they were reducing staff numbers. So it wasn't, yeah, there is a career. I've got some really good friends that are still doing it to this day. Uh, that were on my apprenticeship and uh, but they it's not what it used to be and it's not what these guys are not doing what we were doing back then uh, which is a shame and then um, so yeah I did did that for a couple of years got my finished my A license and then went into the B2 license but ran out of time and come out the other side 
kind of looking at the world going, right, what do I do now? Do I go and continue the license, which is freaking expensive, or do I uh, look for a job? And within about six months, I was working at the RAC at the time in Bristol, um, and uh, I started chatting to this guy who, a couple of weeks before, broken down, and then he was renewing his membership. And I remember speaking to me when he broke down, you needed an add-on, um, like an at-home add-on for his membership. So he phoned up saying, I've broken down, I need this add-on. So I added it on and fudged the figures for him. <laughs> and uh, So then um, a couple of weeks later, he phoned me up and said, I heard your jobs are going to India. And I went, yeah, actually, that's just been announced literally today in the media they're going to India. He goes, um, he goes oh, do you remember we chatted about that like, you used to be an engineer and, and, and stuff? And I said, like, yeah, yeah. Well, come and see me. I've got, I got, I got an idea for you that might help you. I was like, okay. So I went down to his offices and turned out to be a recruitment company that works with Airbus and Boeing and, and companies like that. And uh, he offered me a job in 10 minutes. And that was my kind of entry into recruitment, basically. <laughs> I, lo- I love how people get hustled into working in recruitment. I, it's amazing, isn't it? And I, I thought I, that was unique. But when you start speaking to people, this is a very common situation. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's so I went to work for them for about six or seven more, and actually a little bit longer than less than a year. It was definitely less than a year. It, it was great. Account management, managing engineers in Germany and in America and stuff like that. Uh, so just resourcing contractors, basically, that was. Um, and then um, I don't know, you probably get this being a wreck to wreck. You, you probably look at people's CVs going, how the hell did that happen to that happen? Because I went from that into Reed, but in between. Of, of going from that into read. Um, I had kind of some stop, start stops where I thought I wanted to do something. I even tried a bit of self-employed for about four months, five months at the time, made some money. And then went, and then the missus said, come on, this is taking ages to make money. Go and get a proper job. So I went into read, absolutely loved read and then got poached by Modis. And then some shit happened in Modis where a manager didn't do something and, and it all changed new directors. And there's a really good guy over there that at the time his name was Roy. And, you know, we had a chat and, and it was time for me to move on because they wanted to move some of the biggest accounts I thought they had over to Stevenage. And I was in Bristol at the time. So I thought, Oh, do you know what? Let's go and let's, let's cut ties now. Let's move on. Um, which is quite, quite bad because, I really enjoyed that job. <laughs> and uh, and then the recession hit at that exact same point. And then I went over, um, I moved up to the Midlands with the missus because she was from Tamworth. And then I fell back into Reed after a couple of months in another company. And Let's, uh, let's jump into the, the, the your experience in, in Reed in 2010. Yeah. Interesting business, Reed. Like, good people in there. Like, I... I uh, I agree. I agree. I, I, I headhunt a lot from there, to be honest. Um, the, I always find the recruiters are underachievers. Um, they have it too soft. Uh, but there's enough, they hire well, and there's enough raw material that if you put them onto a more aggressive platform or a See, more specialist platform, they can bill way more because the billings are usually 30 to 50% lower than a lot of the other competitive agencies. Per I head. will. I will gr- I'll agree with you on that one to justify it from Reed's perspective. Well, mine is just anecdotal. You worked every year. Yeah. So. So, so, I mean, I was a manager at Reed, so I was a business manager at Reed, and, and I worked my way up to that as soon as I walked, as soon as I walked through the door. That was my main problem, becoming a business manager. And um, I, the, the, there was a three or four things I disagreed with. They got a nine-month probational period of Reed. So if you ever want to get into recruitment, I always say to people, go to Reed, because that is the best end. It, it, best example of an entry into recruitment that is trained extremely well um the managers that work with you are some of the best managers i've ever worked with it, it, i even to this day i still remember some of the stuff they told me um they've got probably um some of the best billers in recruitment but you don't hear about them um but they, they've also got probably the, some of the lowest billers in recruitment as well at the same time um, the first nine months, I think, I don't know if it's changed, but back in my day, they didn't need to make 25 grand in the first nine nine months. Um, but then after that, if you kind of get past that 18 month period with Reed, you do really well. Yeah, and and it does the marketing, everything that Reed does, it is brilliant because it really stable, it really supports you. When you leave Reed, you realize how much they did for you and how much they 
helped you grow your business. It's it's honestly, it's a, it's a dream job for most recruiters out there if they're not working for them at the moment because the, the amount of work behind the scenes they do to, to keep the business moving forward for everyone is extraordinary. So I did some really good years with them um, and learned a lot. But you are right. The raw material that comes out of them, once you put them in your, in your business and, and give them direction and support, they, they could be some of the best builders in, in, in the industry, for sure. Yeah, it, it blows my mind, though, that they're so big and they're so they're making so much money that they're able to carry so much dead weight just in the just because they're so they're so large. <laughs> yeah. During the recession, which was quite interesting, actually, they said they were never going to make any redundancies, but they did trim the fat from the fact that if people weren't billing, then they have to go out the door. I don't, I don't know what it's like since then, but they really do help and support people. They do get it from that, that supportive sense. Um, but that said, there are some, I would say, pockets within that company which are hardcore, like proper, proper kind of what you would get from some of the backstreet agencies which are higher and fire. There are, there are kind of pockets within the business that still do that. Um, and you have to, if there's a baptism of fire, here's the phone book, get on with it, kind of part of the business. And but, what, what led you to moving on from there? Because you were, you were well established there, you're nearly four years. Yeah, I, 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 if, I, if I'm honest with you, I, I grew read. Um, I just felt that it's time to move on. At the time, um, what was running through my head was, was exactly where I am right now. I want to start my own business. I want to kind of get off off the ground and do my own thing and be my own boss. And that's since probably when I got into recruitment and understood recruitment, that always kind of that, that was where it started. That's when the seed was planted. And when I got to business manager level in, in kind of in, in read, I, I realized that is definitely what I want. And now I've had a bit of an apprenticeship in, in recruitment industry by then, which is, I think it was about seven, eight years at that point. Um, I think I thought I understood enough of it, but what I didn't have is enough kind of, how can I, I'm going to, I'm going to put this in a way that probably sounds crazy, but I didn't have enough kind of in the streets, knife fighting for business type of thing. Whereas Reed, it was, you know, you mentioned Reed to any company. Oh yeah, we know who you are. Here's some jobs. I never had that kind of, right. I needed to understand how to make proper business development and convince people to work with me and, and, and service them correctly. I never had that experience until that mm. point. Um, and then I went to work for a couple of companies and boy, what did I get proven that I really did need to learn and fast. Um, and then I worked for a couple of small companies at that time. But the other thing, the other part of that that I realized is how badly run companies are outside an institution like Reed and how much you appreciate that kind of support and that help that a company like that gives you. Yeah, you I, with... I felt that going from Robert Walters to, well, what was a national company in Canada? But really, it was like, it was like going back in time, where, yeah. like, it, in 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 Walters, like they shined my shoes for me, basically. Like it, yeah. it was yes. all it was all laid out, and it was a regional office, so we did have to, we kind of got the best of both worlds. We learned hard business development, high expectations, but at the same stage you had that big business presence training and intensity behind you so um, yeah yeah it was so bad at one point by the way working for 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 these smaller companies that i actually phoned up an old manager at reed and said i want to come back i honestly i was actually at that point of of my kind of of my mindset at the time that it it, it was so hard out there working for you you know literally surviving and and every five minutes your manager phone you up go you know have you done enough why haven't done enough bd today mm. or you haven't been on the phone long enough today and i never got that i never understood that mm. um, at the time but it was a good baptism of fire to really learn how to do business development and and actually realize that there was a, a there's something between what how we did business and marketed and how they got got on with it and then how the smaller guys did business and how they survived and in between there and, and, and kind of understanding that, that's what I adopted and, and brought into my business and kind of what I do day to day now. And so let's, I do it. let's jump into that. You, you, you set up yourself on 2016. What, yeah. what was your initial plan? What did you, what did you think? What did so, you think you were going to do? And where, what type of things didn't happen that you thought would? 
Um, okay, uh, it's, it's the, I, I initially so when I came out of Thornbaker through and no fault of of anyone's, it just didn't work, and, and the Birmingham office I believe has been closed um, during the, just after I left as their manager. Um, and I went on to jury duty at the time as well, which is quite funny. Um, my my goal was right. I need to do this now. I need to get this sorted because I, I need to be my own my, master of my own destiny. That was point number one. I needed a master of my own destiny. Number two, I needed to create a business that wasn't that that really did have true morals and really did have a direction to go to tell people. You know, I I am honest. I am exactly what I say I am on the tin. And to trust me, this is what you need to do. So my phone keeps. That's a good sign. The phone's ringing. Yeah, I've tried to mute it to now. Um, so, and what I wanted to do is just focus on being that as the as the mainstay. But also, I realised that a lot of kind of a lot of working for agencies, especially working for the smaller boys, not so much working for for the companies like Reed and Modis. You, you you picked up a job and you had to work it. Whereas I want to pick up the right jobs for the right people and work those with those companies as closely as possible. And you never got that opportunity in some of the smaller agencies out there um, because it was literally like, a, like, like, like the, term, the way I say it, it's a knife fight. You've got to survive. But I didn't like that. I didn't like that idea. So I wanted to, to work closely with companies, understand them, and, and, and get into their mindset and, and how they worked and what the manager truly really wanted. And, and that was kind of always been in my heart. And that's why I enjoy working for Reed because that's what you did. You did that. Mm. But also, it, it, you never got the, the chance in smaller agencies to give that quality. It was, it was like a conveyor belt, basically. Um, so that was the main thing. What you realize when you get into that and you try doing that, it does take a long time <laughs> to get into some companies and work with them closely. And I've got some great ones now for years on uh, to work with. But when you say master of your own destiny, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's something I've said a few times as well. And th- the moment I really feel like I am is Sunday night when I'm not worried about going to work. Oh, the next day. That's yes, that's exactly it. And I enjoy it. I'm waiting for Monday to come. And so yeah, same. Six o'clock on Friday after no, Friday evening, I, I actually am disappointed. I've run out of week. I know that's, that's crazy. <laughs> and the little ones running in the office. Come on, this, this, you know you've got to shower me now. And, and you're like, oh for God's sake, I've run out of week. I've got no, t- I've got no time left of the week. And and sometimes I do flick the laptop open on Saturday and Sundays just to, just to keep the, the the business kind of not a flow. It's the wrong word to use, but you know what I mean. Just to keep things moving. <laughs> the process well it, it, it doesn't become work anymore it becomes i've got a moment away from the kids let me see I if call, i can open up and see what's going yeah, on i call it a work-life integration that's, so do i have you stolen that from me no no i've actually that's, i've been calling it for years actually <laughs> People talk about work-life balance it's not a work-life balance i go camping quite a lot and i have my laptop in the tent for me hooked up to my mobile so I can get a signal and I'm doing work. And once the little one's kicking a ball outside and then we go for a swim or, or we go down the beach and uh, yeah, it's, you're not stuck working, but you, you, you integrate it into your life doing BD calls in Asda. It's, it's funny. <laughs> so, so lifestyle business uh, grates my gears as well. Okay. Um, Cause I work hard and I, I work a lot and just because I don't want to set up a call center doesn't mean that I, I should be any less relevant or any less able to to do my job. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Totally agree but there's, that. A, there's a real British and Irish, and, and I suppose Australian as well, when I speak to them, mentality that, you know, you need to, like when you set up a recruitment agency, you need to set it up, scale it, work your way out of the business and then sell it. But in America, it's very different. You know, the, the, the independent, the rise of the independent recruiter is absolutely yeah. rampant. And I can see that creeping in to UK business right now. Do you speak to more and more independent recruiters? Yes, because I, I do a little thing called the recruiter's arms. So There's quite a fair few in there now independent recruiters and because I used a company called SSG to help me start up at the beginning a lot of independent recruiters have kind of 
come to me like a magnet and, and and we chat quite a lot i've i've probably got about five maybe six really close friends in the last couple of years that are independent recruiters that go through the same stuff as me call me for you know i call them as well we talk about problems and issues and and you know we, we truly kind of have a little network going to to support each other and we give jobs sometimes and leads and candidates between each other obviously gdpr compliant wise um, but you, you know it, it's it, i speak to quite a lot of them mm-hmm. and we come to the conclusion on something about growth which some of us you know really want to turn into you know small little businesses with about four or five people working for us or maybe grow even bigger than that but the one thing we come to a conclusion about is we hear people doing it and then they fail after six or seven months and then they've got a hundred percent staff turnover and we think it's vanity that's causing that problem look at me with my big agency of six people i've only been in business nine months and and we think that's projection of vanity into the industry so, rather so than- I, i'll tell you what i think it is and um, i think the industry i think as long as people are, are are still buying agencies and large agencies no you can't exit at all unless you're massive so a lot of the medium to large agencies are hoovering up smaller agencies. And when you're in that growth mode and you, you work for an agency that's going through the growth mode, mm. you buy into that culture. And then that's where your own ego and vanity comes into it because you've only seen that, okay, that's what they're doing. I need to do that. So I, I, I do, I do agree in principle, but I think, I think that there's a bit of a wider reason why. There's a psychology that's probably come with that vanity which like you say is through who they've worked for and and kind of what they've been a, what they've seen and i've seen that as well i've seen money thrown at our people a ridiculous amount of money to grow teams but at the risk of that person not at the risk of the business if that makes sense yeah we, we've had million dollar billers on this podcast who who work from home and you know they they, they just don't want to grow they're, they're making a million a year clearing a million a year after their costs and yeah and they're okay because they've built that up and, and you can do that. But it it really depends on on, on on what you're what you're after. I mean, I think if you if you do want to scale a business now, like you could go to SSG or, or the next level up in terms of like maybe it's the your man cans group or yeah. or, or, or one of the others and, and and they could own your business, you could get a percentage. You could then set up your call center, use their KPIs, use their brand and their marketing, and you're a call center manager. And yeah, you must, but, you must go work for Michael Page if you're going to do that, then, because um, you're not really in control, are you? You might get a piece of the pie, but you're not really in control of that. You must be a good business manager at some of the bigger boys. Yeah, we had a one of our guests was in was in was in the. Was uh, was in the Bur- what do you call what do you call this group again? Ha- Hamilton Knight. No. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, is in, in, in your man uh, James Cairns. Uh, oh, it might be Hamilton Knight. I'm sure that's what it is. Sure. Growth growth uh, thing, and he uh, it was going all right for a few years, but then he exited to set up his own because he just wanted his own direction, his own thing, and uh, and he he seemed to he couldn't go into too much of the details, but. He seemed quite, he seemed, as you know why, but yeah. he seemed uh, but he seemed quite happy that he would made that decision. Yeah, they're just machines, aren't they? Some of those companies, they're just absolute machines. So it's interesting that you have uh, you have a network of other independent recruiters. I have a WhatsApp group of about fifteen Rectorex in it, and 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 you know there's a lot of support in there and a lot of a lot of chat and. You know, we 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 do split some placements and and all the rest, and and I, and I'd like to think now that if if anybody wants to go anywhere in the world or the UK, I'll at least know somewhere to put them into. Yes. Um, and and I think that's 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 important when you're competing against large yes. agencies that that have have that reach. That's yeah. the bit you miss when you've worked for a big agency. You go on your own. You miss that kind of network of people. You know, an accountant comes to you. Do you know anyone? when you're a big company you just send them to another office whereas on your own it's nice to have that because it gives you kudos then in the marketplace you know your stuff you know your market and you know who your your shakers and movers are out there 
How do you manage your own ego when it comes to talking to people about your business and they're saying, so how big are you now? And you're like, well, it's, it's, it's me. But you know, like, how, how, like, cause there's a bit of me, like, there's a bit of me that goes, oh, my, my stomach tightens a little bit. And I go, I think, oh, we spoke three years ago. And it's so good. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't grown. My business got better. Like my profits got better, but essentially I've created a job for myself. And it's yeah, it's it's a strange one, isn't it? I've I've lost work because I'm not big enough, believe it or not. Mm. Um, some of the bigger companies in the in in my industry, you know, they want some they want some of the like the Mawsons and the, the Modises of the world and the Reeds of the world to service their their jobs, but they've only got twenty jobs in the UK, and any size company could probably service twenty jobs. Uh, it's that it's that kind of <laughs> It's that whole Rolls Royce question, isn't it? You know, what would you rather buy, a Rolls Royce or a Ford Focus? And it's like, well, <laughs> which one's going to be cost effective for me? Um, I, I, I t- basically, I'm just straight up and honest. I've been in meetings with people, and I've said, no, I'm on my own. Um, there's a small child that runs in sometimes and answers the phone. Um, but it's, I've tried to when I market myself. People think I'm bigger than I am actually for some reason because the way I market myself. Um, I just know how, that if I market myself in a certain way, it just gets captured by more people rather than specifics. Um, but when when I have that conversation, it's an honest conversation. I am who I am, and mm-hmm. you know, if I need to grow, and that's that's the important part for me. If I need to grow, I will grow, but I don't need to grow. I'm comfortable where I'm at. I'm in this lovely position where, like like yourself, you know, money's happening. I'm paying my bills and, you know, I've created a job, created a stable job. I do get recruiter envy though. Um, and I get, I get recruiter envy over independent recruiters too. And um, because I did tech recruitment for a, a few years before this, and then I speak to independent recruiters and their fees are three times the size. Yes. And, and it, uh, it, it, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit. Um, but then it's just, you just like my, my wife usually sits me down and she's like, is this real or is it just your ego? Like, and I'm like, you know, it's my ego. It's, it's okay. so. Then we talk about that, <laughs> and she con- she counsels me down off a ledge, you know. Um, I-, I wanted to ask you with the recruiter arms. I'm I'm going to be setting up a-, a Facebook group myself, which I suppose it wouldn't be too dissimilar to what you've done at the recruiter's arms. What type of topics are people coming to you about? Like, what- uh, what's reoccurring themes for independent recruiters? I, th- I think if we had this conversation six months ago or maybe a year ago, it would have been GDPR. That was the main topic. Um, I think in the last couple of months, we've touched upon Brexit a few times. Um, that's been kind of a concern uh, for some people. Um, general kind of recruitment issues, and, and some people have some some HR issues, which we take offline rather than speaking in, in a forum kind of style. Um, I'm trying to think actually what's been the kind of the biggest one. I talked about contractors in the last couple of weeks and kind of uh, and ideas of growing the contractor base um, mm. has been kind of one of them. Um, but yeah, people come with all sorts of questions. Marketing, I've been asked about video. I've actually been asked to do kind of a um, would I would I do a video course and how how to help recruiters get into video, which is a, a thought of mine. I would like to look into, but how also, how would you, how would you go about that? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll do. I'll, I'll interview. Uh, I'll, I'll interview our made from job video and uh, and come back to you with that. Yeah, it's more for marketing. Like if you've seen some of my stuff on some of my videos, it's more more for kind of how do you go about it? How do you do it? You know, you're not spending thousands and thousands of pounds on equipment and stuff like that, um, and and content. You know, I've I've got lots of content out there. I think I got nearly seventy videos of talking about getting a job or how to find better candidates and stuff. So so people have noticed I do that quite a lot. Like it, which is surprising. <laughs> and uh, and then they've asked me, you know, teach them, which I would honestly love to do. It's, uh, it's Have you done the full solution, though? No. Mm. That's what I'm working on at the moment. That's so we're, gonna, we're going to New York, and we're going to video what it's like to be a recruiter over there. 
Um, yeah. And I've hired a videographer for two days. Going to meet with clients. We're going to do it in conjunction with the podcast. But yeah. I think that the wider strategy for that is to make sure you know who exactly you're targeting with that content in terms of their data yeah. and then pushing that out on an omni-channel to use a current phrase yeah. um, and make, making sure it's hitting them all day on that. So, And then creating, the- creating funnels to make sure that that comes back and captures into calls which turn into placements. And that's, that's kind of on my mind this year. That's, that's good. The important part, the, the, the one number one thing I would say to people with regards to video, it's all about the content and the information and you tell, you're telling people about whatever the subject matter is. Where video starts falling apart is, uh, in my opinion, in the recruitment industry, is that it's, it's that corporate masturbation where they talk about themselves and not talk about anything else. That's only good for one thing, and that's trying to find new people to come and work for you that like that's kind there's, of there's one there's one guy that does that online a lot and it's real bad exactly and and it only covers what not even point zero zero one of your audience yeah. so you need you have to reach out to your audience and say this is who i am and, and when you put a job out there to work for you people will see you you are kind of trustworthy because they've seen you talk about stuff and, and they understand you and they, and they know which direction you're going in rather than managers talking about themselves who wants to watch that? <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard. I it's I think it's hard. It's very hard for the people at bigger brands to develop a personal brand because the, it's very hard for them to be authentic when they're being told how to do stuff all day long and being managed by yeah. certain metrics. And a lot of them are just kind of there for the ride. Whereas yeah. when it's your own business, it's a lot easier to do the storytelling on it. Oh, of course, yeah. I agree. I agree. So Just, if you were to give any advice to any recruiters that are looking to set up now, what, uh, how, how would you kind of, like if somebody came to you and said, Mark, I want to set up, um, what have you learned in the last few years? How can, like, how, how could I structure my business to make sure that I, I'm still in business a year later? What would you say? I think the, the, the number one thing before you even push the button is, in go in a quiet room and and say to yourself can i really really do this do i have all the tools in my mind can i go out there and get into the knife fights and win them and and find business and and be able to fill that business with whatever the, whatever you think that that the way of, of filling it whether it's just using linkedin looking at job boards or whatever your network however you do it so if you can answer that one question first of all then you should bill in the first couple of months but then also, look at, your, look at your finances, look at your personal finances, look at everything to do with money. How long can you survive without billing? Um, have you saved enough money for that? Have you, you, bought- you need six months. You need at least six months. You need at least six months. Um, some people I know, they've got to nine months and they've made one placement and then they think they're a failure. And what I try to remind people is you're, not, you're starting from ground zero with zero influence in the marketplace. Yes, you, you were the top biller in the last company, but you, 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 you haven't got 20, 30 years of that last company's marketing influence, a knowledge of the marketplace, a marketing department. You haven't got any of that. You're doing this on your own in your bedroom from ground zero. Mm. So you need to understand that if a placement in nine months is good. You've made a placement. Your business, your theory has worked but you need to give yourself at least 12 to 18 months to start what I call norming. So placing every month and doing and making money every month. Mm-hmm. So you've got, you've got to get to that point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really important. I think a lot of people talk about money, starting up with money and, and, and making those, those first placements. But I think that's equally as important as your mindset and making sure that you, you know, you come in positive every day because the moment you're negative, go and get a job, go and get a job. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough to manage your emotions, though, you know, because people let you down all day, oh, every day. Oh, yeah. But that's the nature of our beast, though, isn't it? The recruitment industry is what is it? Ninety five percent negativity and five percent positivity. You know, it's it's all about rejection <laughs> in our industry, and you have to manage your emotions across that. So yeah, your your um, emotional intelligence has got to be doesn't have to be high. You don't have to be a robot, but you, you've got to be able to control that. 
and the things piss you off, go for a walk because you can, because you're an, you're your own boss. Um, what's the what's the number one thing that's holding you back from making more money right now? Um, I think from from my perspective, it's it's do I stick with manufacturing and engineering and look into another sector? I think mm. that's what's holding me back. Um, and what is that sector, and what do I need to do next? The grass is always greener, hey. This is it, and and you know, come June this year, the you know the whole world might have flipped on its uh, again, and and we're back to kind of growth mode, and we're not worrying about Brexit. Brexit's a distant memory by then. Yeah. So, Re- renew renewable engineers, renewable energy engineers would be a yeah a, a smart one to to sidestep into, or automation robotics or something like that. There. Something yeah. that's niche and lends to what you've done before. Um, definitely, yeah. Those, those are the areas. Definitely, those are the areas. I, I've got clients in those eight regions. And given yeah. given that fees are a lot, be- God, Birmingham's a tough place to do business. Given that fees are 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 better in Europe, in Asia, and in America, have you have you dabbled in trying to do any overseas recruitment as well? So I've had a few companies I've worked with in the UK that have overseas kind of businesses. Yeah. And I've, I've done an, I've done a little bit in Ireland um, with an electronics company. I've done a little bit in Belgium, a little bit in Portugal as well. But that's, that's all I've done in the last four years is that it's, it, you know, when you've kind of got the list of stuff you want to grow into mm. is at the top of that list. And the, the nervousness at the moment of Brexit is kind of making me stand back one step and think, mm, you know, what do I really need to do now next? Do I yeah. wait for breath or do I go head into it now? But I think as soon as we know what the fate is, I think I'll, I'll be a lot more comfortable in moving. Yeah. Place, sure. My next hire is, uh, is is going to be just a a, so, a, a sourcing administrator and and uh, she'll probably be focused on the European market next because I have somebody on Asia and then I have somebody on the US and uh, and Australia. So, that's... what's the market at the moment? Then, from your perspective, what was really growing in the recruitment world? Um, I think I think America is going through an unbelievable boom, and it's it's the the golden age of recruitment there. And there's people who don't have a clue who are making 30k placement fees, and <laughs> it's 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 happening. Like they're make, if you if you're in any of the Facebook groups, you can tell. Like there's people who've had basically a cup of tea in the recruitment industry set up by themselves, and they've they've cashed in on some of their initial network. Now we're at the top of the market, so let's see what happens when things tighten up. But yeah, yeah. as it stands, America's flying. Um, I suppose what one of the things okay money goes so right now I can see that there was a lot setting up in New York but that was only because they used New York as a hub to, to do the rest of America but there's lots more now that are setting up in LA and they're using that there to branch out there um, to, to branch out to that side of the country essentially um, but then if oil and gas goes, then we're back into that boom. So uh, I know a lot I know a lot of people, actually a few people that are UK based companies, but they do a lot of work in New York in the, the banking and finance industries and uh, hedge funds and that kind of thing. Yeah. That seems to be that seems to be a big thing now. Well um, no, my, my mate my mate runs a construction recruitment firm out of Northern Ireland doing the east coast of America. So but it's it's really easy to do that if you're product driven and you're not working jobs. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, and that's how they do it. You know, they they get one good candidate. They make sure that that profile goes to everybody it could possibly go to. Open up a few doors, sign some terms. Then they always know what that profile looks like. So it's just an aggressive race for candidates, and and then they're going to market on that. Whereas, and that's what the UK mentality is doing and that's where the that's where the U, the US people see the US yeah. the UK as that's it and also I've from what what I'm learning about the American market they're very open or more open to retainers than they are than the British market is as mm. well which is something that I've I've learned quite a lot about the American market 
So it's, I think, I think there's a future for for British recruiters to to do a lot in America, actually. Big, big time. And you know, I I, I have recruiter envy all day long thinking about it. Um, <laughs> but but you know, you could put yourself out of business by by trying to do too much and to trying to damage your brand by you know doing something completely different. So it's. That's this is my nervousness. You know, I everyone knows me as an engineering recruiter, yeah. uh, and I, you know, not a lot of people know I I know how to do social care, I know how to do social workers, I know how to do accountants, and I know how to do quite a lot. Of but there's there's different strands of engineering that wouldn't harm your brand. It would just be like, oh, okay, he's doing that engineering as well. Yeah, exactly, and th- and that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Yeah. I've dabbled into different kind of sectors of the last well, of the last four years, and. You know, there's materials handling sector that is, I would say, fairly doing well at the moment in the UK, which is a lot of warehousing and stuff like that. And then there's, um, like you say, energy. That's really kind of turned a massive corner in the last couple of years. I know there's some issues in nuclear at the moment, but, you know, energy, alternate energy is doing very well. Mm. Very strong. Now, before we go, one last question. Sure. Given what you've done and how you've done it, working for yourself over the last few years, what things, if you could start again from day one, would you mm. do? Would you do that you didn't do? Ooh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think because it took me a while to to get into certain types of marketing and certain ways of doing stuff. I think I would have done video straight away. That was one of the first things. It took two and a half years to get into video properly. Um, I think I would have looked at maybe bringing a a mentor in i've not had one i've never had one i've just taken advice off people and now that i'm starting to speak to people in the industry more i feel like we're we're mentoring through a network if you know i mean we're all kind of chatting to each other so i think i would have looked at that more sooner Mm. uh, because that's really helped me um and i think the the other one as well is is i i worked out on my emails too much i should have utilize the database a lot stronger the crm a lot stronger at the beginning i think that there was a second year i think i really looked at the crm and, and properly used it as a tool analytically as well and now i you know for i'm in my fourth year i'm actually looking back on, on stuff thinking right that happened there and that happened there so so these guys should be growing now and, and that analyticalness has worked and i'm starting to get work through for being a lot more, more surgical and the way I, I work in the industry. So it's, yeah, so th- those are the things where at the beginning I was Media, just... mentor, and uh, and using the system properly. Yeah, three great points, eh? Um, three things I could do better myself. <laughs> <laughs> You're not always going to be perfect at them, yeah. but if you had to start again, then those are the definitely the three things I would do. There's probably other things as well, but those are the things that come to mind. Mark Hopkins, thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Absolute pleasure. Take care and we'll talk soon. Yeah. Take care, mate. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Some good advice from Mark there at the very end. And uh, I think we could all uh, do with being a little bit better with our system and our data with creating media and finding somebody out there that can help bring us to the next level. I'm still on the fence about this advisor thing. Um, I'm kind of using a lot of the people I meet in this podcast series to get ideas from and to uh, advise on certain things. And I I quite like that. I, I, I believe that in recruitment, People should use recruiters that are experts in their space. And I think it's very hard for business advisors to be experts in every area. So if I want to learn about sourcing, I go and I find the best people in the world and that and I get them on the show. The same as the same as sales, same as media. I, I see I see who's doing what and then I try and get them in, whether it's Facebook ads like we had with DSP. And I just I think there's a lot of waffle sometimes with advisors. But then again, when we spoke to uh, Safe from uh, Digital Gurus and how he said John O'Sullivan structured their business and later 
brokered the deal that helped him exit and let him ride off into the sunset if he wanted. That type of stuff I have to look at and go, wow, that's incredible. So so maybe maybe I should have got a, an advisor from day one. I don't know. It's uh it's it's all a learning process and I'm by no means the finished article, but this podcast cast and these guests are helping me figure out what's next and really making my job much more enjoyable and being able to communicate with all of you on the stuff we discuss has been great as well. And hopefully we're going to launch our Facebook group after we get our marketing and branding done in the next month or so so we can all bring our ideas together and uh, see how we can get a bit more out of our businesses. All right, hopefully I'll be all back on later on today um, to get another great guest on. There's a couple of things that are on my mind that I want to figure out within my own business. I just want to be able to do more through automation and through outsourcing. So I kind of want to jump into that subject a bit more. I'm scraping the surfaces of it at the moment, but like any of you, I'm, I'm I'm sure we all think there's more to come out there. So I'm keen to get as much juice squeezed out of this orange as possible. And in order to do that, we're going to speak to some fantastic guests that have done that in their own business. All right. So happy hunting. See you later on today, hopefully. And please, please do send this to an agency recruiter or an internal recruiter or anybody in the industry that you think would enjoy it, would make a good guest or has an opinion because I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear them. And if you could give us five stars on iTunes, that'd be great. Some person has gone in recently and given me one star. A few suspects come to mind, but will not name anybody so it's uh it's it's dropped it down to 4.5 stars which 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 is heartbreaking so if you could do me a favor and drop it a wee five star that would be much appreciated all right till next time the podcast you just heard was made using anchor ever thought about making your own podcast anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.